statute was actually created back in then, those that decade. The Housing and Urban Development was created uh, as part of the Great Society, the Johnson, President Johnson's era. Um, he had some really good ideas about creating a safety net for folks, uh, including housing. And so HUD was the anchor for that. Um, in the 70s, we have all this tired old Nixon come in <laughs> and put the kibosh on all affordable housing. He just nixed it all, Nixon did. You know, <laughs> he just, psh, no more affordable housing in this country will be built under my <coughs> Nixon administration. You know? And at the same time, basically urban renewal became the domain of local cities and counties, urban <coughs> renewal, okay? So any of us that were around at that time watched certainly LA City transform you know, Bunker Hill that turned into the marvelous music center and all the housing that goes with that, you know? But all the people who were dislocated as a result of urban renewal <coughs> of old town tenderloins and skid rows. Right. Okay, I've just jumped two decades and it's up to you to do all your little history seeking then because really the early 80s with our next Republican hey. president, <laughs> the movie star, Donald <laughs> Reagan, you know, really, really ready to be the president of the United States. He gets in and he basically dismantles all of the New Deal and Great Society social programs. Dismantles all of the safety nets. Um, particularly, he dismantled all federal funding for affordable housing production. This is key. You know, you don't have homelessness if you have enough affordable, accessible housing available for people. And we haven't in so many decades now that, you know, the, the presumption that we can end homelessness if we don't even have housing for people makes no sense, all right? So it was in the 80s that a number of movements converge, all right? And converge to create what at that time we called the crisis of homelessness, all right? veterans returning from the Vietnam War with all sorts of problems, drug addictions, PTSD, and all the trauma that comes with having been in that war. They're coming back and they have no place to go. Right? Connect the dots here. The same thing's happening in the last 10 years. Right? In 2000 and on, we've got the Iraq wars, we've got Afghanistan, we've got all these wars where we're sending our troops and they're coming home. And there's too many vets out there that are homeless. And they're not just homeless because they don't feel like kicking around after being in this structured army. They're homeless because they can't deal with some of what they're coming back to and nobody's offering them a home. There aren't the support systems. <coughs> You know, we're going through the same thing in the same cycle, okay? But anyway, back then it was the Vietnam War. Reagan was also the primary leader in dismantling the mental institutions. Mm -hmm. Up until that time, folks with mental illness were confined to large mental institutions for their care. And a number of things occurred. Uh, in the 60s and 70s. Um, the human rights, civil rights movement was a big thing at that time for us. And it came down to people with disabling conditions having rights as well. And per people with mental illness should be able to be out in the community and free and not coerced into institutions because they have a health condition, right? So that was one issue. Another was the Social Security Administration determined, gee, people with mental illness really do have disabilities. 
So maybe they should be able to qualify for SSI and SSDI. Until then, people with mental illness didn't qualify for those benefits. But in the 80s, that became a possibility. Um, we also had new drugs that we were finding out about, mostly because of the war in Vietnam. We were finding out that Thorazine um, and Haldol helped some of our soldiers deal with trauma by just sort of tranquilizing them. So we started, hmm, let's try that on our mental ill folks that are, you know, just anxiety ridden and responding to voices and all of this. And darn if it worked, it reduced the symptoms to such an extent that these folks became quite manageable. So it became possible to have them live in our communities rather than chained to walls in institutions. And finally, Reagan and his cohorts realized, geez, these mental institutions are costing us a bundle of money, just like our prisons are today. Maybe if we shut them down, we'll save some money. We'll put a little bit of it over here in community mental health. We'll start little clinics for these folks when they get back in their communities so they can take their meds and all that, you know. But let's, let's save some money. Okay, so all of those converge to create what we call deinstitutionalization. Right. We also had, as I said, a huge reduction in affordable housing. Okay? Not only because it wasn't being funded, but areas like our skid row were dismantling our SR, SRO housing. We were taking down whole buildings, all right? And so were a lot of other uh, cities doing the same. And, um, and at the same time, we're seeing a lot more poor people. Again, connect the dots. What are we seeing today? Look at the 30-year cycle. Today, we have a lot more poor people a lot less affordable housing, all right? Income inequality massively changing. And then um, another thing I want to point out during that time is that we had a lot of people challenged by alcoholism and drug addiction. And because of those health conditions, they were marginalized. They were criminalized. Right? The drug war started way back in the 1920s. We had prohibition for alcohol. We had prohibition for drugs. Alcohol, it was learned, it wasn't working to prohibit alcohol because there were way too many rich folks being affected. All right? So let's get rid of that. We won't have, we'll legalize alcohol. But you know, all these folks of color and poor people using drugs, we just can't have that. So we're going to keep the prohibition on drugs. And we're going to make sure, one, that we criminalize the use of drugs, and two, we're going to put all of the marketing of drugs into the hands of drug dealers. We're going to help them make projects. All right? And that's what we did. And we, shot up the cost of drugs for people where their lives were spent now trying to treat a health condition called addiction by having to go to criminals to get their drugs and they had to pay prices they didn't have money for so they turned to doing things that aren't so good to keep up their habit. And most of them are on the streets. Um, and then finally we have, of course, industrialization, immigration, the things that basically change seasonal employment, something that isn't available anymore, um, and industrialization taking jobs out of unions and everything else, and so people can't make a living, they can't support their family. Okay. 
So all of this is happening, late 70s, early 80s, and the mushrooming of homeless people. How do we know we've got so many more homeless people? Because they're now so public. They're out on our streets. They're in our parks. They're not hidden anymore. They're not off in the margins of Venice. You know, they're right there in front of us because there's too many of them. And too many of them having to do very private things publicly. Okay? So those of us that were around at that time, we realize this is a crisis. We know how to handle some crises. We're social workers. Of course we know what to do. So we got busy setting up shelters and basements at churches, food banks, and food kitchens. We had it going, right? We had people coming in, getting in those shelters, laying on army cots. You know, we had FEMA money from the federal government supporting this emergency. You know, got to get them off the streets. This is looking too bad for our rich country to have these people wandering and begging and being very public. So this crescendo, well, I don't see anybody possibly that would remember Hands Across America. Do any of you know about Hands Across America? Anyway, in the mid-80s, a bunch of us organized nationally a day called Hands Across America, where literally across the country we held hands. One united effort, held hands all across the country at a particular moment on a particular day. All right? And it was in support of ending homelessness. All right? we were, it was a fundraising effort, obviously, but it was a unifying voice saying, we can't continue to have this many people homeless on the street. You know? It was fascinating and wonderful and exciting. And darned if we woke up the next day and looked around, hi, hi, those people are still out there. What's that about? You know, we all unified in your support, but you're still out there? And what started turning? The compassion. You know, just do a flip on compassion, because if those people are still out there after all this, they just want to be out there. They're the problem. They're the problem. You know, they need to get fixed. You know? And that's how we started building the continuum of care. Right? <coughs> but before I get into that, I want to talk about Los Angeles City and only secondarily county and what they decided to do about the homeless problem in LA. We decided to preserve and contain our skid row. 40 square block area that is still there. It's being messed with, but it's still there. And we would move all of our unwashed and unwanted and disposable people into that area so that they could get all their needs met in that area. All right? And that would, that would take care of our homeless problem because as long as we squash them into that 40 square block area, then they're not going to be a problem for the rest of the city and the county. Right? And I, I want to um, read from the Central City East, that's the fancy name for Skidmore, Central City East Public Policy, written in 1975. It's to date still the policy. As the present character of Skid Row has a negative effect upon other areas of downtown, emphasis is placed upon locating new facilities in the eastern portion of the present Skid Row. Within this area, improved services and facilities needed by all inhabitants would be provided, thereby contributing to improving living conditions and reducing the necessity for residents to utilize other portions of downtown. The guiding policy regarding Skid Row suggests 
attraction and consolidation rather than dispersal. The policy recognizes the existence the policy recognizes the existence of skid row lifestyle people. Do you know any of those people? As a social economic problem, notice we're going from people to problem. Now they're problems, not people. Which cannot be solved by physical removal. To physically intervene into that community with the intention of dispersal would transfer the problem to other areas in Los Angeles, to areas less equipped to provide for these residents, and areas more vulnerable to the ill effects of these people. That's the policy, right? Um, on the good side of that policy, um, we have developed, we stopped tearing down as world housing. We started building quality buildings, schedule housing trust, SRO housing, you know, good agencies that build, build quality buildings. Um, on the plus and the minus side, we took those messy shacks of missions, LA mission, Union Rescue mission, Midnight mission, all right, on the outskirts, they were kind of on the margins of Skid Row, square block area and they were kind of little shacky places and so CRA went to them and said you know we really like you to move into the road because you're outside of the containment area if you'll do that we'll buy up your crappy little property here we'll sell you a piece of property inside and we'll give you the money to build Where those big buildings came from? R2. R2. Redevelopment. Yay. <laughs> okay. So they did it. And if you visited the Union Rescue Mission or Midnight Mission, or LA Mission, man, are those buildings something. The gymnasium. Oh, God. Which is really good, you know. I mean, that's respectful of the people that are using those services. But you know, missions are pretty much there to um, build a flock. Tele television, tele what is it? Telemarket, the flock, and raise money to support the flock. Um, so the missions got a, a lot of benefit out of it, and they do a benefit for the row, but there's still a big culture shift that we need them to make, which is people need to get out of missions and have a home. You know. They may be your cow, your cash cow, but you know, they need a home. <laughs> you know? They don't need you to keep giving them the bunk bed. You know? Okay. Um, and now, you know, coming forward, of course, our skid row is being redeveloped. It's being encroached upon. And at some point, that real estate will go we will lose <coughs> control of that forty square block area. And people will be dispersed. They are being dispersed um, with no better place to go. Um, and whether we call it safer cities or broken windows or gentrification or whatever, it's all for the benefit of the new urban renewal. Forcing poor people out of the area. That's the trend. So, thank goodness we do have Skidder Housing Trust and SRO Housing holding an anchor in there, uh, downtown Newman Center. Um, you know, just hopefully being able to hold on to their real estate and keep it there for uh, people with limited income. Getting back to the larger. Um, in the 1990s, 
um, we're starting to see the development of the continuum of care, which translates to those neat little basement shelters and churches and everything turned to freestanding shelters. It costs quite a bit of money uh, to build. Um, they become facilities with programs because now we of course realize that these people that are choosing to be out there need to now kind of get into programs and figure out you know how to put themselves back together so that they can be ready to be housed because they can't just get housed they have to get programs you know because they you know they need a lot of fixing and so we've got to have this these programs to fix them and so build up professionally. What was a grassroots kind of seat of our pants effort to provide emergency shelter to a little glossier case management, social workers, you know, to help people manage their lives and um, get them through programs. The food banks and the soup kitchens have to be licensed. And, you know. um, so now we have developed this in the 90s through the post 2000s, this continuum of care where we're managing homelessness now, all right? Including in 2000, beginning to count them. We do them every two years, these count. Um, we're counting them. And the census, the US census every 10 years, 2000 started a little category of homeless people as part of the census. This is really institutionalizing homelessness, isn't it? You know what was a crisis? We now institutionalize it. We count them in our census. They're part of the fabric of our society. Homeless people are now the fabric of our society. A problem. They are the problem. And not only are they identified as a problem that needs fixing, so we have this whole continuum of care to do that, but in addition, um, their behavior out there, you know, sleeping in the parks and, you know, peeing in the bushes and having sex in the tent, all this stuff, that's criminal behavior. That, that doesn't belong in public. <coughs> So we got to put these people in jail, teach them a lesson. Right? So we criminalize a lot of the homeless behavior, um, and just a point: um, the first ten-year plan to end homelessness was created in 2000 by the National Alliance to End Homelessness. That was 2000. I don't know what they're calling that plan right now, but it's kind of five years after. Um, from 2000 on, we've got some good stuff happening. We've got some Section 8 housing choice vouchers, which are getting access to poor people in particular and gradually to more of our homeless. Um, shelter plus care vouchers becoming available um, to people with mental illness. <coughs> addictions and HIV AIDS. Um, those are good things. They access housing to people who prior to that didn't have access. Um, in the early 2000s, we start identifying a subgroup of homeless people. We call them chronic homeless. How did we get chronic homeless? How did we go from homeless to chronic homeless? It took a few decades, didn't it? Those of us that have been around for a while, some of you now, are seeing third generation homeless people. You know, it's their parents or their grandparents who are the chronic homeless. Um, it's the mentally ill folks that never did get access to community mental health. Okay? Um, they don't get it now. And they didn't get it back then, right? Community mental health never really happened. There's been efforts, but mostly it's never gotten the resources it needs. 
And mental health, as I'm sure some of you or all of you have experienced, Department of Mental Health, Community Mental Health, is very hard to access to our people, isn't it? You know, yeah. try getting somebody in for an intake and seeing a psychiatrist mm -hmm. in the same day and not have to wait three months see that psychiatrist and get through. Try getting that same person into detox and get a county bed in a residential treatment program. Try that. See how long it takes before they're so exhausted waiting and trying to hang on by their fingernails. You know, until those systems, those big mental health and drug abuse systems really become accessible to our people, until then, we're not going to solve homelessness. Because those people can't survive, whether they're housed or not, unless they have those treatments available to them, you know, in an accessible, humane way. Um, so what do we do with these folks in the meantime? We provide them this continuum of care. But of course, if we criminalize a lot of their behavior, they end up in jail. And our Twin Towers County Jail becomes the largest mental institution in the country. That's what happens. It still is. Because we criminalize mental illness behavior. You know, if you're talking to voices and acting aggressive, we're going to pick you up and put you in jail. Um, I'm going to read something from Peter Marin, guy that's based in Santa Barbara. Anybody without a place in the social order is seen as a threat or the source of terrible things. You help people because it will destroy society if you don't, or you must imprison them. Another aspect of homelessness is people with marginal personalities. There's a whole system of people getting marginalized. If you don't do well in school, you drop out because you have a particular kind of nature, not necessarily being a bad guy. If you go to war and you see a lot of stuff that you can't integrate into the world around you when you come back, then you drop out. You're marginalized because you've seen too much of death and violence. Almost everyone on the streets has had a horrendous childhood. They had the crap beat out of them, or families have fallen apart, family died. It used to be, if you drop out, you went to sea, or you went to dig gold, or cut lumber. There were things to do economically, if you wanted to be on the fringe of things. Now, very little. So nowadays, if you're on the fringe of things, you end up homeless. And now another quote from... At all periods and on all continents, the fear, pay attention, the fear of disorder, insecurity, epidemics, and criminality focuses on the populations which are the furthest from the established norm. Okay. Just one example. We had when HIV suddenly took hold. Who was the population everybody looked at? The gay population. Who was being sent off to some kind of seclusion because they had AIDS? You know, that was our first reaction, wasn't it? It wasn't compassion and how can we help you any more than the Ebola crisis did. You know, it was how can we protect everybody else from you? You know, how can we marginalize you? you know? um, these populations are disqualified, demonized, and devalued to the extent that they are considered to be useless to society. That's what we've done with homeless people. We've disqualified them, disenfranchised them from rights, and we've marginalized them to the Arroyo, all right? Not the Arroyo up where they were, but now in the Arroyo in 
my own mother. Okay. Just wherever we can push them, the farther we can push them so that they're not in our view. It's not so we can help them. We just kind of push them out of the way. We don't know what else to do with them. You know? So, finally, um, due to the drug war, which translates to the criminalization of drug use, I want to point out, you all got this bibliography, and if any of you read books anymore, <laughs> um, put it on a tablet. Whatever will get you to read it, please read some of this stuff. Okay? Because I'm talking about the drug war right now. There's a book that just came out that is fascinating and a really good read, okay, called Chasing the Scream, the first and last phase of the war on drugs. Fascinating. And you'll, you'll be able to connect all these dots that I'm doing, okay? Um, and then what I'm about to quote from is The New Jim Crow. How many of you are familiar with that book by Michelle Alexander? Oh, gotta read it, gotta read it. Gotta understand why people are in prison, why we got 80% of people in prison because of drug offenses. 80% help? That's what we do with people with drug offenses, you know, and what, 60% are people of color? <coughs> um, so many of our chronically homeless people are caught up in that criminal justice, I say, quote unquote, system. They're caught up in it because their behaviors have been criminalized, because their drug use has been criminalized, and so they're caught up in the criminal justice system and many of us understand getting caught up in the criminal justice system gives you a life sentence. Not just a six month sentence, a life sentence, okay? The whites, Michelle Alexander, the whites only signs may be gone, but new signs have gone up. A criminal record today authorizes precisely the forms of discrimination we supposedly left behind Discrimination in employment, housing, education, public benefits, voting, and jury service. A lifetime of shame, contempt, scorn, and exclusion. In the last 10 years, back to solutions, we've developed permanent supportive housing as one really good way of helping people get into housing, establishing a home, and giving them the supports they need to make that all work. Right? Good. Really good. And there's not nearly enough of it. So it's still a promise out there, and still so little of it. And just one more remark I want to make. That continuum of care, that we built, which was this whole new layer of housing and services separated for the homeless folks. You know, we had the whole system of care for poor folks. Not a very good one, but we had it. But we had to develop a whole other <coughs> system, continuum of care for homeless folks. And HUD was a lot of why that was sustainable. Well. I decided several years ago they get, they're going to get out of the shelter business. That, it doesn't belong to us. We're going to get back into putting our money, prioritizing permanent housing. Good. Good. But at the same time, they dismantled the shelter system, so now all of us are stuck with people having to work with them on the streets uh, towards getting them into housing. But it takes, what, four months more to get them through the whole, all the loops to get them into housing, even if we use housing first, okay, to get the voucher, to do all of that stuff. You know, meanwhile, they're on the streets for the most part because we don't have a way to shelter them. Um, so that's the downside of it. And, and it didn't, HUD deciding to prioritize on permanent housing didn't ex translate to 
wow, a big buildup of permanent housing, affordable housing, because the federal priorities are still a little off, aren't they? We're still fighting wars in the Middle East and North Africa. We're still fighting the drug war. How many billions of dollars are going into those failed wars? You know, we're just the drug war money. If we took all that money and put it into drug and alcohol treatment across the country, really accessible on-demand drug treatment, we would end Just, just do it now. Would help. All right. Um, I think that's that's where I'm going to stop because with the dismantling the continuum of care, we of course are now everybody's targeting permanent housing or permanent supportive housing, housing first, hopefully harm reduction. Uh, strategies, getting people off the street and into housing, focusing on chronic being most vulnerable. And I'm going to let Peggy uh, take it from there with all the things that have been put into place to try to tackle that next wave. Unless anybody wants to correct anything I've said or, or asked.